think let us start with the session. So yeah, yeah, we, we we call upon the panelists to begin the session, uh, starting with Dr. J.S. Dityal, hmm? uh, Dr. D. Ramamurthy, Dr. Mahipal Sajdev, Dr. Suvin Bhattacharya, Dr. Uh, Vasavada Raghunath, Dr. Arup Chakrabarti, and Dr. Partha Biswas. Over to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Swapnila, uh, for our introduction. Uh, as a, uh, one of the chief instructors for this uh, instruction course, on a difficult situation in cataract surgery, I would like to uh, welcome all my uh, instructors, right from our D. Ramamurthy sir, Dr. Mahipal Sadev, Subin Bhattacharji, Arup Chakravarti, and Sal Vasavada. So we're going to take you through the entire gamut of difficult situation, either with the case or it is faced by a surgeon on the table, and how we sail through this difficult situation Going to highlight it in this interesting uh, instruction course, which has been there for uh, many, many years, with the <laughs> kind support of all my you know, instructors. The first speaker will be uh, Dr. D. Ramabhuti. And we know that uh, he is one of the best possible uh, person and surgeon beyond excellence in all fields he's, he's got into. One of the uh, master and administrator, He's done wonderful work for many societies, including AIOS, world-renowned uh, FACO refractive surgeon. We'll be benefiting with him. He's going to take us through the uh, difficult scenario of intumors and white cataracts. <clears throat> Dr. D. Ramamurthy, sir. OK, Abhay is there. Uh, welcome, Dr. Abhay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so, yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Titial. It's indeed a proud privilege and honor to be a part of your course and I really learn a lot from you all the time. Uh, the topic given to me is how Sorry, to deal with... Screen not visible. Sorry? Yeah. Your screen is not coming. It's all white. You can re-share re, uh, the screen. Just, just to guide you, sir, you need to, uh, on your PPT, open your PPT first in the laptop, mm -hmm. then uh, click on share screen. So it, it should be open in your laptop first. Yeah. I, I think, sir, this is the whiteboard. Can you? Uh, I'll guide you through, sir. So uh, is the PPT open at your end on the yeah. laptop? Yeah, yeah, it's very much open. It's in one corner. I mean, I've minimized it and I've, I shared the screen and then subsequently I uh, bring on the... Okay. So, uh, so when you click on share screen, there would be three options available in the center, up center, basic, advanced. Yeah. Up for this file. So you have to go on the basic one, basic tab. There you would be able to see your PPT. Click on your PPT, sir. See, I have minimized my uh, this thing at the bottom. Can I? I have clicked on the basic. Can I press on the PPT now? Yes, yes, sir. Correct. It is not visible to us, sir. I think no, you should sir, open I, the PPT, I, you know, first. Huh? You get a why don't why uh, you have minimized? You know, let it uh, remain sir, open first on the. Sir, PPT minimize nahi karna hai. Okay. <clears throat> Drawing board, Ara. <laughs> so we can help you with this. Uh, uh, I don't know. I've done this so, so often. I mean, so just one minute. Mail it to us, sir. If we can uh, show it at our part from the back end. Videos, how do you mail it? That's it's difficult. It's one second. One second. Now I think I'll get it. No, sir. No, Abhi bhi nahi aa raha. It's all uh, actually white screen. No? White board, yeah. This is the white board, sir. Okay, I think you know we can sort it out. Should we go to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Ramamurthy? Sure, sir. I have a couple of other commitments. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, I've done this too so often, but I'm exactly doing what. 
helping us me and my entire you know area of interest for a, such a long time and i have learned so much from him not only in a field of ophthalmology in other regards also and i know that he's done a wonderful work for aiways and we wish him all the best for a future adventures and keep helping us sir and thanks that you have been a part of my ics dr mehpal sir thank you uh, dr titial it's always a pleasure being with you and uh, our association uh, i am very fond of it uh, is everything in order yes sir yes sir okay. so i'll be talking <clears throat> about management of heart cataract and when you are looking at a heart cataract uh, uh, it is really a challenge even for the most experienced surgeons though there has been significant improvement in the technologies that are available in the echo machine now when you look at the uh, the studies that have happened this is the famous swedish capsule rupture study which clearly uh, shows white and brunescent heart cataracts are associated with increased risk of capsular toxicity as the muted please good excuse me yeah thank you Uh, so what has been shown is that a white and brunescent heart cataracts are associated with an increased risk of capsular rupture so you have to start right from the pre operative you can actually see the uh, hard brown black lens that is shining on to you but the pre operative assessment would involve looking at how much is the pupillary dilatation nowadays the tamsulosin use has complicated things for us a specular microscopy to look at the corneal endothelium is important zonular integrity needs to be seen whether uh, there is any weakness or not whether there is pseudo exfoliation etc or not the morphology of the cataract and posterior segment evaluation these are the other important things that you need to do now when you are looking at a heart cataract the challenges are the following which has been written the first is that there is a compromise in the visibility because the red reflex may not be uh, good often because of the milky fluid the red reflex goes away the second thing is because of the capsular changes and poor visibility doing a ccc becomes a problem the ac depth is often compromised because the lens having uh, been sitting there actually tends to become uh, more in volume and there is less surgical space for manipulation then there are uh, cortico capsular adhesions which can happen and that makes hydro dissection and rotation difficult but the most important thing the biggest problem the bug bear is this leathery Uh, fibers that you have which are which is a problem that uh, you have to break these leathery fibers of the nucleus to be able to uh, uh, to get away with the phaco emulsification so when you are looking at the nucleus what is very important is that it is a biconvex structure and the central portion is the thickest so normally youngsters tend to go towards the periphery and try to split but that does not mean that it is going to come to the center to split it so what is very very important whether you do a trench uh, and then do a splitting or you do a direct chopping the main important thing is that this depth needs to be about 90% of the depth and you need to have a through and through uh, cut so what is important is the central part of the nucleus that needs to be broken this periphery will follow on its own so you don't have to concentrate on the periphery the center is what is uh, doing to be done so if you have a shallow uh, if you have a, a shallow trench and you are doing the vector forces are such that it will not crack this is how the vector forces are coming like this but if you have a deep enough, uh, enough trench and you have these both instruments down then the vector forces go like this rather than coming like this and they will be able to crack the nucleus well a uh, nuclear emulsification you can do a direct chop you can do a, a divide and conquer stop and chop but my preferred technique is a primary chop which uh, actually reduces 
time that is taken and uh, unnecessary beko emulsification may not be required uh, modifications can be done as crater and chop sculpt and chop drill and chop these are modifications which allow so let me just show you uh, the important things that i have said good visco elastic uh, good fluid and you can see this is a very very dense uh, leathery uh, fiber which is there so what we are doing is that you can see that we are going deep in and a chopper which is sharp you can see we are holding it and it is the central portion that we are trying to disassemble so look here again we are trying to uh, disassemble until of course this backbone is broken uh, you can see we are coming to the center with the chopper the hold is solid uh, which is there and then we uh, when then we rotate the nucleus again bury into the depth of the nucleus what is most important is the depth and see that we are trying to break this here until of course this separation is complete uh we will not be able to remove the nuclear fragments which you can see now we can remove so wh what is important is that uh, the machine setting should be known to you we have put visco elastic again you can see we are going into the depth of the nucleus and again holding it and doing the chopping only in the central portion and breaking these leathery fibers the machine settings you can see we are going to 500 plus vacuum uh, in these particular case the machine settings would depend on the machine that you are using and again you can break the nucleus into as small a piece as you want so fluidics based surgery is something very very important the power is used to drill so that you go deep into it so that you have a good vacuum seal and then you have to break the center portion and break the leathery fibers that is there uh, i'll just uh, show you another particular case and this is the signature machine which is uh, much older but you can see again uh, there was an attempt uh, to go to Uh, to the fluid based system now this is a 19 gauge needle that you use in hard cataracts we prefer the 19 and look at the solid hold even right here you can see that the hold is very solid i am within the rim of the capsular axis my chopper is here and you can see that we are uh, separating it with a lateral movement and doing a separation which is there uh, for uh, the nucleus you can see this uh, overlay which is showing uh, that how we are uh, working at that particular level now uh, the important thing here is that if you are not getting a separation uh, what i am wanting to show in this is that instead of the feco handpiece you can also use uh, uh, two manipulators which you can see here you can use uh, two manipulators or a hook to separate out these pieces and to again then go ahead and use the chopper at this and see this is the leathery fiber still this backbone see that is the breaking of the backbone once you have the breaking of the backbone then you can go ahead and again you can see break the backbone make them into smaller pieces and use good visco elastic to take it out now this is the power of femto as i will tell you in a in a black cataract which is, uh, we are using uh, you can see you make a larger capsular axis which is about 5.2 uh you get a good neat capsular axis in this particular case and uh, you can see that uh, actually this case was being considered for an SICS by my colleague said that let us do an SICS and then i think even both dr tetial and myself we have never been trained for SICS we went from ECC to feco i said let us just do a femto and in this particular case again you can see we are going at the rim of the capsular axis and just watch that the machine uh, is holding the nucleus pretty well look at these bubbles that is coming and look at the ease at which we got the crack uh, so typically uh, uh, we are increasing the repetition rates in the femto to three times but uh, now i am doing it only at two dr chi says it does not make a difference whether you are doing the repetition increase or not but again the central core of the nucleus is broken by the power of femto and i'll just show you the color of the nucleus look at it it's uh, actually a black cataract uh, which is there and uh, you can have the nuclear fragment but you need to use good visco elastic and uh, use very little power at this particular time with high fluidics which is there the important key again is to break the nucleus here and uh, to uh, kind of uh do an aspiration when you are at the last fragment that is the time when you have to reduce the uh, the uh, vacuum settings because it is at this time that you might because of the lack of any support uh you might get a um, uh, uh, change in the uh, fl uh, fluidics and you could get a posterior capsular rent which is there uh in this particular case and this is the ia that is done and you get a good outcome so friends uh, good visco elastic is something very required bss plus if you can use Uh, working in the center of the area and breaking the backbone of the nucleus that is there uh, these are the difficult situations that you get in nuclear emulsification and you need to 
take care that the incomplete separation becomes a complete separation and that is where you have to be patient and do uh, particular things and as i told you there is an absence of an epinuclear cushion for protection of the posterior capsule so moderate phaco moderate your phaco power um, uh, matrix you can go from one setting to another uh, with a click and that is what you need viscoelastic will need to be injected at times of uh, uh, below the, uh, to uh, cover the anterior capsule now whenever there is a pct that's a separate uh, top altogether but uh, an early detection will lead to good optical management and i told, told you it is not during the time of phaco emulsification that you have uh, the problem it is normally at the last piece or when you are doing uh, the epinuclear removal uh, that you can have a tear so at that particular time use disperses ovd tamponade the posterior capsule may be converted into a capsule or excess and continue with your uh, with your procedure now the last thing that i wish to say is that uh, when you are doing uh, 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 a hard cataract there is going to be damage because of the surgical time to uh, the cornea, so visco chondroitin sulfate is something which is very, very important. BSS plus is something that is very, very important. Uh, Fecoing away from the cornea is also something very important. And I always uh, use uh, atropine at the end of the surgery so that any ciliary, um, the, the ciliary body is relaxed and the inflammation that is there uh, is significantly reduced. And because you have to use steroids, etc., for a long time in these particular cases, you should supplement it with NSAIDs to prevent the inflammation uh, go reaching to the macula, that is the chance of CME in these particular cases. Uh, steroids needs to be given a little more intensively along with cycloplegics. And the IOP needs to be monitored in these particular cases, specifically if you have used Viscote or, uh, uh, or uh, Helon, etc. So these are a couple of the tips that I have wanted to give you as regards hard cataract. And uh, hard cataract, uh, if handled properly, uh, will come out with good results for you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. you are on mute we cannot listen to you okay thank you thank you sir uh, wonderfully covered the entire uh, steps of heart cataract i think you covered uh, endothelial protection how to crack the uh, heart nucleus uh, right from the backbone and subsequently uh, managing the emulsification in a very nice way and the power of fem2 i think you rightly stressed uh, how effectively it can decrease the phaco energy and surgical time also uh, one comments from uh, Dr. Abhay before we shift to Dr. D. Ramaguti. No, I think uh, that was very well comprehensive presentation. But the key, as he mentioned, is to make sure that you really divide totally anterior, posteriorly, and then periphery to center, whatever the tricks you have. Direct chop is a very good technique. I love that. But many times you need to have multi level chop. As you said, you need to go deeper and deeper progressively near bring your divisional instrumentation deeper at the plane bottom plate and, and divide don't hesitate to repeat that chopping maneuver at a deeper plane so that's wonderful my father thank, thank you thank you thank you Abhay, for your inputs uh, let me invite uh, dr d ramamurthy i think he's ready with his presentation yeah <laughs> Okay. Uh, sincere apologies for all the confusion. I mean, I think uh, there's always uh, there to learn. So I'll be covering about intumors and cataracts. And uh, it's just a series of videos that I have. And this is uh, basically, I always believe in creating a small neck and then subsequently removing whatever cortical matter, if it flows out, it's fine. Otherwise, you just uh, uh, remove that and then inject a dispersive viscoelastic on top of the um, capsule, intact capsule. And as you can see, the whole procedure uh, proceeds in a very methodical manner. And especially when it's flocculent cortex, it might be necessary to do multiple aspiration of the cortical material. So always extremely important to make sure that we are not injecting the viscoelastic into the capsular bag because that itself might cause a runaway. Most of these intumescent cataracts are associated with a brittle nucleus. So actually removal of the nucleus is not really a challenge. And just in case you get a smaller rexis like this, I always uh, uh, polish the uh, rim of the anterior capsule so that there's no capsular phimosis. 
one other thing that we could do is also to create small nicks in this uh, rexis margin so that the tendency for uh, rexis phimosis is not there the uh, the cartoon here is extremely important while you watch the video basically uh, the idea is to keep the intracameral pressure higher than the intralenticular pressure so that you have a flat anterior capsular surface that's the reason we uh, aspirate uh, liquid uh, um, lens material from the capsular bag or keep injecting viscoelastics as i'm going to be doing now so that you have a flat anterior uh, capsule the moment this uh, relationship is disturbed and the capsule moves forward there is a tendency for the uh, rexis to run off into the periphery and essentially the successful rexis in these situations entirely depending depends upon balancing these two forces of uh, retaining the intracameral pressure higher than the intralenticular pressure whatever be the measures that you adapt as you can see over here there are multiple aspirations that are being conducted and each time the viscoelastic is being injected the intracameral pressure is increased then subsequently uh, in a very methodical manner initially started out with a um, 26 gauge needle now so what are forces that you use i would like to concentrate on this particular step it's taking a while losing my patience this viscoelastic is running over here but i try to complete the rexis and that's exactly when this is should not have been done i should have refilled the with the viscoelastic so you can see right at the very end i get a rexis run off simply because there was viscoelastic which was leaking out i did not care to refill the anterior chamber of course managed to uh, do the case without the uh, wrap around of the rexis and then uh, implanted a lens suffice it to say that as far as you are able to keep the intracameral pressure uh, more than the intralenticular pressure whatever be the means you employ then the uh, situation is, is well under control pediatric cataracts is another situation and especially if it's uh, combined with a uh, intumescent cataract like this then it's a double challenge in the sense that you have to deal with a very elastic capsule at the same time the capsule is bulging forward and in these cases you always aim at a much smaller rexis than what you want usually i aim at around a 4 to 4.5 mm rexis end up getting around a 5 5.5 mm rexis in case a posterior capsular rexis becomes necessary that should be within the confines of the anterior capsular rexis and as you can see i'm grasping regrasping providing a proceeding in a very methodical manner even if it's not a intumescent cataract like this it's a good idea to um, stain all these capsules simply because it reduces the amount of elasticity and gives you a little better control i believe in these pediatric cataracts once you get an adequate rexis then 75% of the surgery is over as you can see over here removing the uh, fairly liquid cortical material is no challenge and that subsequently you can go ahead with the rest of the surgery in case you have a situation where there is a bit of a rexis run off in spite of uh, all the uh, maneuvers that you have taken as you can see over here i am proceeding with the um, uh, uh, creation of the capsular rexis but as i come here there is a certain amount of a tendency for the rexis to run off towards the periphery and uh, i correctly go back and uh, aspirate a certain amount of lenticular material and then refill the anterior chamber with the dispersive viscoelastic and uh, that's uh, then go back right now you please uh, watch at this point there is a tendency for the rexis to run off into the periphery and this is exactly uh, where you have to be extremely careful and instead of going around in a curvy linear fashion like this it's trying to extend like this in this situation the normal tendency would be to regrasp and drag it like this what has been uh, uh, described by the uh, brand little and i find it always helps is to go back here let me just uh, take you through that step once more even if it takes a little while because i think this is a very important step and uh, that's aspiration of the lenticular material the tendency for the rexis to run off and i really graph the rexis margin over here drag it in this direction in the direction which i was creating the rexis drag it towards the center and the apex and that gets you a hold over the rexis and once again brings it back uh, into position and then you are able to proceed with the rexis in the plan manner you can see i am dragging it back towards the apex of the cornea and towards centrally and then i am able to get a control over the rexis and proceed in a more methodical manner as i said the injection of the uh, 
uh, sometimes it's a good idea to even use a cohesive viscoelastic because that flattens out the anterior capsule even better than a dispersive viscoelastic. Maybe this is the one day situation where I would recommend a cohesive viscoelastic. As you can see here, subsequent to the intraocular lens implantation, you can see there has been a tendency for it to run away, but it has been brought back by this tech, uh, by our uh, brand little maneuver of pulling it back, pulling it centrally and towards the apex. And in case you have a situation like this, where it's a, a morgagning cataract and you are, uh, uh, it's not only the anterior capsule, even the posterior capsule is very tremulous and there is a tendency for it to trample in. Obviously, the uh, lenticular material flows out. You create an adequate capsular excess, usually about 4.5 millimeters. And here I'm bringing out the entire heart nucleus into the anterior chamber. And because the, the patient was one eye, I had already lost the other eye, did not want to risk uh, uh, the posterior capsule, any risk to it. So I go ahead and implant the intraocular lens. And it's again a brittle cataract. And using the right phaco emulsification parameters, uh, I'm doing the phaco emulsification as posteriorly as possible. Of course, there would be a certain amount of loss of uh, uh, endothelial cells. But then, uh, as you could maybe visualize in the end, I used a 2.8 millimeter sleeve and completed the phaco emulsification with the intraocular lens acting as a scaffold. Uh, in case you have access to digital marking devices, that's again a great way to go. As you can see here, I have a 5.8 millimeter, I want a 5.5 millimeter axis, but I uh, adjust my capsular axis at uh, 5.8 millimeters. The idea is to run the axis within the confines of this capsular axis, the, uh, the digital marking device that I have. And that uh, essentially is a great device. Uh, using a simple five millimeter marking on the cornea and then using it as a uh, control is also a good idea. And that also works very well. Now coming on to white cataracts and usage of laser, as you can see over here, it's an intumescent cataract. You can see it bulging forward. Maybe this is the most important indication and use for a, a laser cataract surgery and the creation of capsular excess in a situation like this. As you can see, it's a free floating excess that you have over here. And uh, basically, I don't even have to do anything with it. I just go in with the FACO probe and the excess just close in. It's not always the situation like this. In a situation like this, where you have the uh, again an intumescent cataract, uh, as you can see over here, uh, <clears throat> we are going to end up with a disrupted capsule over here, and uh, everything seems to be under control. Only when I stained the capsule, I realized that uh, basically because of the gush of fluid from the uh, confines of the capsular bag. Even in spite of the availability of a laser platform, there is a disruption of the capsule and I had to go back and uh, um, create a, uh, complete the intraocular lens implantation. In this case, the situation is slightly different. You can see that the, uh, it's again an intumescent cataract and there's a certain amount of capsular fibrosis that is also there. I'm able to create the excess, but then when I stained the capsule, I, uh, I realized that it's not a completely free floating excess. As you can see over here, there are shreds of capsule over here. And that you have to be cognizant of the fact that this could sometimes happen. Mind you, this is selection of a few cases. Most often, when you use a laser platform on these intestines and cataracts, you get away with a very nice excess being formed. But you must be aware of the fact that sometimes you can get a situation like this. But you, again, you have a template to go ahead and create the, the complete the excess. You have just to give, got to be careful, recognize this, and then go ahead and the, complete the excess in a methodical manner. As you can see, there are a couple of places where it has run off, not into the periphery, but up to the excess margin. What I essentially do is to exactly do the maneuvers that we are used to doing while creating the excess and completing the excess in this uh, manner. And then subsequently, of course, surgery is quite routine. <clears throat> Uh, last of my slides, and uh, as you can see over here, uh, uh, when you essentially have a grid pattern, you can, may not uh, visualize a situation like this where the excess is not complete, but you have to be aware of this fact. And then essentially what I do is to wrap around that area where the excess is not complete. And you can see the small dent over here that's been created. That's because I was aware of the fact that excess is not complete over there. And uh, with the Utrat of forceps, I generally went around that and completed the excess. It's important that you are aware of these facts in spite of the fact that you might have a laser platform available to you. 
thank you, uh, Dr. Ramamurthy. Wonderful collections of white cataracts. I'll request Subin to uh, share his uh, presentation. And I think you rightly showed the difficult uh, part is the rexis in a white cataract. And you managed uh, to give us uh, some tips where you can retrieve the rexis from the difficult situations. And uh, use of femtosecond laser also rightly stressed would be uh, one of the good indication uh, in white cataracts. Thank you again, sir. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Dr. Suvin, uh, you can yes. start your presentation. I, I, just a moment. I can't see my whole screen. What's yes, happened? There, much? Yeah, I'm there, but I, uh, I can't see my screen. Just a moment. Something's happened over here. We all know Subin has been uh, one of the, I think, Indian innovator who has signed uh, across the world with his uh, innovative work. And that includes his... Uh, I don't know, why is my sharing is... Presumption. But we can see yeah, your yeah, uh, screen. Yeah. You know? Now, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Right, sir. Uh, so, now... Can let you me make go slide show? Yes, I'll go to full slide show. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? And can you can see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hooks and, uh, thank you, Dr. Tikal, sir, for this uh, invitation uh, year after year on this uh, your wonderful course of yours. I, I'll be speaking on hooks and rings in small pupil. Uh, I have a financial interest in the BX pupil expander. I do acknowledge the contribution of uh, uh, Dr. Deepak Megur uh, for one of his videos. Now, can we can preoperative pupil dilatation be used to predict IFS? Well, this paper in JCRS, uh, JCRS, JCRS concludes that for a pupil, seven millimeter or smaller, the risk of IFS existed regardless of alpha block, blocker treatment. So uh, these are the list of conditions which can cause IFS and including systemic conditions like hypertension and chronic heart failure, diabetes. So no amount of history taking can prevent surprises and intraoperative myosis is unpredictable. So let's come to terms with that. So. I believe that to use iris hooks and people expanders, we need a disciplined approach. So every eye is an IFIS and it till proven otherwise. So we need to reduce our threshold for using people devices. We need to keep a stock. And the other things that I'll be talking about today is viscoelastic injection, where and how much to use. How do we test and redistinguish the elastic from the non-elastic rigid people and the choice of people device based on elasticity of the people or how you wish to tear the rigid pupil. A big question is, how big do you want the pupil to be? And which would be the best device in IFIS? So when we inject viscoelastic, if we inject it anterior to the iris, what we are doing is we are flattening the iris against the lens capsule. And that is counterproductive to our cause because we are not leaving any space for the device and the AC becomes deep. So whether you're using iris hooks or pupil expander, it's the same story. So the best would be to inject viscoelastic under the pupil margin so that you lift off the pupil margin a little and have anterior bowing of the iris. That leaves space for your pupil expander or the iris hooks, the flanges, whatever you're using. So David Chang and John Campbell told us in 2005 about the IFIS and they said that unlike the non-elastic myotic pupils, the IFIS pupil immediately snaps back to its original size following attempts to stretch it. So small pupils are of two types, elastic and non-elastic. That must be very clear. They're just two types. How do you distinguish? The elastic pupil is like a rubber band. So any pupil expander would work. The non-elastic is like a string. So it won't stretch. It can tear or break. So a strong or bulky pupil expander or Kuglin hooks are required. This distinct discrimination is, or distinct, we need to distinguish absolutely. Now, how do you check for elasticity before you start the case? So once you've made the paracentesis, inject BSS, the pupil momentarily expands. And that is a sure sign that the pupil is elastic. Otherwise, it won't expand. Whereas if you have a rigid pupil, it's terrible and breakable, but not expansile. So you have to render it. You may inject as much viscoelastic as you want or BSS, it will not expand. So you need to tear it with two Kuglin hooks or a bulky expander, whichever you choose. Now, when you have it expanded at this stage or slightly larger, you could use any device and you have a wonderfully round pupil at the end of surgery. So mechanical dilatation of the pupil, IFIS is an elastic pupil, pupil stretching is not effective and not required. In a rigid or fibrotic pupil, a controlled stretching before the expander or iris hooks is effective and gives you a very good cosmesis. So we have iris refractors and hooks, and we have the malugan ring and the BX pupil expander and other things. So let's talk about the iris hooks first. Let me make the side quotes first. I'm sorry my videos from the iris are very old because I've not used them in a long time. 
We make paracentesis in a clear cornea and posterior directed and leave a conjunctival mark. Otherwise, it would be embarrassing when you can't find one. Just leave that small conjunctival mark. It works wonders. Retract the stopper far enough, hold the hook sideways, insert it, turn it, and hook the iris. Now you advance the stopper. So it's important to retract that stopper, otherwise it gets embarrassing. FACO incision is made only after the uh, uh, pupil is dilated. Do not get carried away by the pupil expand by the expansion. Now remember the pupil margin is always elevated to the limbal plane and it's anti-flex. So all your instruments are going to have difficulty as you come in. So keep them slightly anteriorly positioned as you enter, as you negotiate past the pupil margin. To remove, just hold that stopper, advance the hook, turn it, the same reverse actions and pull it out. It just momentarily straightens and it come, comes out. Hold that stopper, advance that hook, no heroics, no rocket science, and just pull it out. That's as simple as that. Uh, uh, well, the disadvantage of the iris hooks, you have multiple corneal incisions. There is a risk of infection, though theoretical maybe to some. And there is a tendency of over-retraction. And I believe that this space in the corners, this space in the corners is wasted space. We did not require this retraction and we have it, retracted it and that is going to cause a poor cosmetic result. And we could have marks and that could let an uh, irregular pupil, which could lead to a glare. So we come to the B hex. We have a hexagonal shape, thick, strong flanges, thin, flexible notches, and tabs for holding. That makes the B hex. How is it different from the malignant ring or eye ring or whatever has been there before? The scrolls, channels, or pockets of all previous devices are biplanar structures. They snag the incision and they require an injector and they have a thick profile. The scrolls straddle the pupil margin, whereas the B hex, the notches and flanges are all in a single plane. The injector is obviated. It's a thin profile device and the pupil margin actually straddles the notch. What we are doing is with iris is being bent without harm, which we can use to our advantage. So what matters most is the elasticity of the pupil and not the size. How big do you want the pupil to be? Aren't we all skilled enough to perform a FACO through a 5.5 pupil? Most of us would do, even without a device. So if I give you a pupil which is dilated and uh, with, with, with the assurance that it won't come down, well, BX, BX gives us that assurance or even iris hooks. So do not get tempted to expand it more than 5.5. Let's look at this uh, rigid pupil, hard cataract with serious solution. My recommendation is less than four millimeters rigid pupil. Please stretch it before you use any device. There goes the first flange and the second flange and the third flange. And you have a wonderfully dilated hexagon. This is a pretty hard cataract. So no one can say that you cannot get a hard cataract through a 5.5. All that you need to do is chop it into small fragments and you can get it through a, out through a 5.5. Eye implantation is not a problem. Removal of the ring is not a problem. So any device, 5.5 is good. Let's look at which would be the best device. Now, this there's a lot of debate on this. Every surgeon feels that he has a best device for IFIS. Now, in IFIS, if you look at the two major components, meiosis and iris prolapse, as far as Meiosis is concerned, iris hooks and pupil expanders both provide constant pupil size, provide good visibility, and allows safe FACO emulsification. Now, when we come to the iris prolapse, no device helps. Iris prolapse depends on IFS severity and pathological damage to the iris stroma and muscles. So there is no credit to the pupil device when you don't have iris prolapse. It's just lower grade IFIS. The same device may work in one case and may not work in the other case. Please do not get surprised. It's just the different grade of IFIS. So a favorable device in IFIS would be one which requires small incisions, has a low vertical profile, can exit through side ports, iris hooks, and BHEX would probably be best suited for this. Now let's look at this BHEX being removed through a one millimeter side port. No device can do that. And that is a big blessing when you are working in IFIS and in a shallow anterior chamber. Now, let's look at intraoperative myosis. So There's a big concern over here that the Malugin ring or all other devices, when on the top view, you cannot see the scrolls or the openings, the scrolls or the pockets. So you can inadvertently engage the capsular excess margin, and that would be a disaster. In the BHEX, you do not have that. The notches are face facing you, and you have full control at the site where you're tucking, so you do not engage the capsular excess margin with certainty. Inject viscoelastic under the pupil margin and over the capsular ring, pull that flange, tuck it under the pupil margin, and you have instant confirmation under direct visualization that you have not in engaged the capsule. Even if you do, you can retract and go, go back again. And then you, have, you are very safe to do your uh, FACO emulsification. 
Now, this is a wonderful video by Dr. Michael Henry, uh, which was uh, published in uh, a by AO very recently. It's a one minute video. Shallow entry chamber, glaucoma tube shunt, single incision used, expanded the pupil with the uh, single incision used to expand the pupil. A thin BX was maneuvered around the tube. Watch that. This is the third flange, which is being left. And there, that's being manipulated around the tube, under the tube, and tucks the, under the pupil margin. That is the huge advantage of the thin, thin profile of the BHEX that allows you to work in very small cramped spaces. No other device would allow you. That's because the BX has a very thin profile of 75 microns. So my choice of pupil expander in intraoperative myosis would be either iris hooks or a BX pupil expander because of the advantages that we have stated and that the, these two uh, can safely allow you not to catch the capsular excess margin. When it comes to a sub subluxated cataract, I would put 100% iris hooks. There is no doubt about that because iris hooks allow you to asymmetrically expand the pupil in clock hours of interest, which is what we want in subluxated cataracts. If you're interested in reading more about tips and tricks on the BHEX, I would like you to uh, download this uh, PDF, which has video links, which run along the text, and it opens the exact scene. You could go to the page BHEX People Expander and subpage ophthalmic surgeon, and it's free to download. If you want to read a little more about uh, tips, my tips on fake emulsification in small people, I would encourage you to check out this uh, article on eofta.com. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Tikiel, sir, for this wonderful opportunity once again. Thank you. Thank you, Subin, for highlighting uh, the advantage of uh, pupillary expanded devices, uh, especially uh, looking into uh, different situations. I request Avay to give one comment. Uh, in the meantime, I'll share my screen. I think, Subin, you are our hero. You've really done a great job to us. But my, my one point for the delegate is to use the low parameters in eye fields. All the rings and hooks are okay, but you will not need it if you use the right parameters in the other words, inflow and outflow. You Nine out of 10 times, you won't need any of these devices. So keep the faculty fluid uh, as a top priority. But Suen, you've done a great job and Absolutely. we are so lucky to have you. Thank Absolutely you. agree with you, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely rightly said uh, by Avay, and Subhan is a star. Thank uh, you, sir, for your kind words. done such a wonderful work. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Avay, for your comments. Uh, let me uh, begin from where Subhan left. That is, uh, I'm going to take you through some of the tips for a subluxated cataracts. No financial disclosure for my side. We all know uh, the examination of any patient would, would be a basic important request from a surgeon to a his assistant to give him the details of what type of case he's facing with. And that's true with the subluxated cataracts also. Always look for an amount of subluxation, that is by phacodonosis. The position of lens, degree of subluxation in clock hours, a condition of genules is very, very important. And evidence of any associated things like pseudo exploration or chronic uh, uh, inflammatory disorders, glaucoma, any uh, trauma, history of trauma will be important. So this all we know that amount of subluxation will decide what type of surgical procedure you're going to do. If you have a less than uh, five clock hour of subluxation, maybe you can get away with just a simple CTR, uh, then getting a back centralized in these cases. Just to show you how we approach the back fixation in a correct manner is very, very important uh, aspect with uh, Subin also talked about. So this is a patient who has almost, you know, uh, five to six clock hour subluxation. So we know that femtosecond will be advantageous in such situations, which we have published also the technique of femtosecond application in these cases. But it is very important to stabilize the bag before we actually jump in for a FACO in these cases. So this is a standard way of, a, of making a side port here, which is at the limbus. Once you put a limbus side, uh, incision, you are iris hooks or lens hooks going to track traction and the entire lens di iris diaphragm will be lifted up. Therefore, to avoid that, we need to do little posterior incisions. You can see here, I'm going little posterior here. You can see bleeding uh, as Subin talked about. So we'll be as parallel to the iris plane as possible. Therefore, when we hook the capsular axis margin, the capsule will not tint and that will not increase the chances of either capsule getting torn or there will not be a stress during your surgery also. So if you do it anteriorly, 
there will be a tenting to the capsule and your surgery can become uh, difficult. Sometimes you can damage the capsular axis margin also. After we have done a capsular axis of a desired size, which is slightly smaller than the routine cases, because lens is not uh, properly centralized. So this is towards the unsubluxated area. The iris hooks is placed with a viscoelastic cover. And make sure your, your iris hooks are vertically towards your incision so that there's not much of radial traction tension to the capsular axis margin. So these three hooks are going to stabilize the entire bag and remove the whatever anterior debris you have that may be cortex, sometimes they may be vitreous also that has to be cleaned up before we initiate the FACO in these cases. The one important thing to learn here is before we do any procedure of pressurizing the anterior chamber, the, the bag has to be stabilized. So this is what I'm doing because these hooks were touching the lid margin. So I've just trimmed these hooks so that they are not going to touch the lid margin when actually we do FACO. And that will also decrease the uh, pressure tension in a capsular axis margin. So FACO can be easily uh, completed. Make sure your bag is uh, well filled towards end because the bag can be loose in these cases. So dispersive viscoelastic can be used followed by a CTR insertion. Once I have uh, removed the entire uh, cortex, I have removed the CTR, uh, the hooks also, then in inserted the eye wheel. I thought there's a little bit of uh, vitreous there that I've done a vitrectomy also. The tips is put your hooks in a right manner so that we don't uh, damage the uh, remaining capsule axis margin and subluxation cartilage. So this was a manual surgery for a cases with subluxation and the basic tips. What about femtosecond laser? I think femtosecond laser has a huge advantage there because we can do a capsulotomy without opening the entry chamber. Because once you open the entry chamber, entire lens diaphragm can change and you increase the subluxation in these cases. Second important thing is getting the nucleus emulsification or a nucleus chopping, again, without opening the anterior chamber. Effectively, you are decreasing the uh, requirement of FACO energy in these cases. And the third important aspect will be getting your incisions placed comfortably without opening or decompression the entry chamber. So these three important aspects are covered in femtosecond laser before uh, we damage the dynamics of uh, subluxation cataract in these cases. Just to show you one case of uh, subluxation cataract, femtosecond uh, application here. In these cases, normally I would do a, a one ring and uh, eight chops and take the capsular axis to the area of uh, largest uh, interest or visible area. And size will be a little smaller. Normally it is 5.1 for me, it is 4.8 here. And subsequently, OCT gives you all the dimension of giving. You can see a vitreous uh, is also there in the entry chamber. That's why when your laser is applied, you can see a gel formation because the vitreous is there. And this is a chalk pattern which has been uh, created in this particular case here. Subsequently, complete the incision here. The corneal incision opened very, very effectively. Now I'm making another incision that is a posterior limbal incision to stabilize the bag. Stain your anterior capsule in all cases of difficult situation holds true for the subluxated cataract also. Luckily, the rexis was complete and we'll stabilize the back with iris hooks, stain the anterior chamber with uh, tansinolone and do a complete vitrectomy to remove uh, it from the, especially all the areas where we going to cause more traction during the emulsification. So once we have done a complete vitrectomy, we'll not do any hydro procedure because we have done a rings of delineation and chop pattern. The nucleus is removed without any hydro procedure here effectively. Subsequently, with a bimineral aspiration, irrigation aspiration method, you can remove the cortical fibers. Then we'll put the CTR in a formed, uh, maintained capsular bag. Sometimes it's very difficult to aspirate cortical fiber if you put CTR before in the subluxated cataract. If possible, we should put uh, CTR after the cortical uh, removal in these cases. The lens has been implanted and that part will remove all the hooks. Then again, stain the entry chamber with transinolone. Make sure you don't have any vitreous traction or uh, sometimes there'll be little vitreous coming towards the main wound or uh, towards the side port that has to be taken care of. The idea here is to make sure you don't leave any traction because these cases are compromised and any traction will also cause posterior segment problem in the post-op period. In the post-op period in all subluxated cataracts, 
it may be traumatic or non traumatic uh, you need to rule out the uh, angle damage in these cases always they may have a high intraocular pressure subsequently that needs to be managed in direct ophthalmoscopy to rule out any peripheral retinal uh, changes macular oct subsequently is very very important in all these cases a lifelong follow up for this patient for a decentration of eye well subluxation might increase the fibrosis because sometimes the capsule rexis may be very very small and uh, you can have a, a fibrosis happening in these cases so if you have that uh, i would suggest do a new yark laser relaxing anterior capsulotomy in these cases of a rexis margin and that will decrease the chances of a capsular fibrosis happening subsequently so these are basic tips of a subluxation cataract uh, and a femtosecond may give little advantage always make sure your bag is stable before we intervene if after the completion of phaco your bag is unstable don't put lens uh, in those cases fix the bag or uh, remove the bag and do a scleral fixation in these cases uh, either primary sitting or a secondary sitting also always have a good counseling with the patient that that's going to help your post op uh, management also thank you uh, for listening uh, I would invite Dr. Abai and one comment from Arup regarding this presentation. Sir, I just uh, logged in. Sir, I was in the other hall. But uh, you, you are experienced uh, surgeon for a subluxated catheter. You can share your experience. Abai, you can share your presentation, please. Uh, in certain situations where uh, subluxation presents uh, along with the vitreous, it is important to manage the vitreous uh, in uh, uh, coordination with the subluxated cataract management. So it is important to be familiar with past and anterior vitrectomy. Because if you have a cataract and it's AD of zonular dialysis to which a vitreous knuckle is uh, coming through, if removing the vitreous from the anterior approach may be a little com cumbersome, it may not be complete. So it, it, if you are adept with the past and approach, you can remove it from behind. And then use a visco shield strategy in a wedge of visco, uh, uh, dispersive visco, the, uh, 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 at the area of the zonular dialysis, and then put a cohesive uh, visco to cover that area. So I think this is this yeah. is a strategy which I found quite useful. Uh, yeah, in, that's uh, a very business. good point. Very good point. And I will always vouch for that. Uh, you have to go past plana in these cases to you know manage the vitreous. Are you able to join, uh, share your screen, Doctor Abai? You are muted. You are muted, Abhay. Yeah, please share your screen, Abhay. Uh, we are not getting the Zoom. Uh, I mean, we are getting the Zoom, but we have lost our presentation. Yeah, we got it's it come, now. It's, it's come, okay. it's come now. Yeah. Right, okay. So I do receive research grant support from Alcon, but there's no relevance on this presentation of, uh, of managing the posterior cataract with different density and recognize the contribution of Shale and many others. Also acknowledge the contribution of Dr. Osher and many other stalwarts like Jivan Tithyal, uh, Maifar, and others who taught me how to manage posterior polar cataract. For me and for others, avoid rapid bulge of hydraulic pressure and therefore no subcapsular or cortical cleaving hydrodissection. Creating a mechanical cushion effect is very important. And I think the conventional hydrodilation is a wonderful technique. Sometimes it can be a nuisance if it produces a subcapsular inadvertent hydro rupture. And we feel that inside out delineation as an advantage uh, of uh, avoiding that inadvertent subcapsular hydro dissection. And you can have a controlled uh, demarcation or, or delineation, and you can penetrate the wall of that space or a core. Uh, you created at the right depth to create an appropriate depth of mechanical cushion effect. But that's very important, whatever you do. And finally, the, I mean, not finally, but the other important thing is to adhere to the closed chamber technique. And therefore, tricks like uh, uh, injecting uh, viscoelastic, dispersive viscoelastic, and I recommend viscoat, but uh, uh, whatever you are having before you retract the instrumentation. And this is something very, very important. Having removed the nucleus, the final moment of removing that cushion or epinucleus that you created. And that's what happens here. I'm creating a mechan a communication between the posterior compartment and the anterior ch chamber by detaching the peripheral capsule, but not actually removing it. And that will produce less hydraulic pressure in that critical compartment and therefore 
no rapture. I find like Dr. Tichyal and Maipar and many others uh, flex a very advantageous in postipolar cataract. And in our own hand, we have been able to reduce our, our rate from 36% in 1999 to 4% now with flex techniques. And, and uh, we feel it is really very useful. Now, particularly when you have a denser nucleus, so the soft cataract is easy, but when you have a denser nucleus, the additional cushions uh, which are created with this flex really help. And you can then shell out the firmer nucleus rims of cushions and fit it into the, into the FACO probe. And mind you, the FACO parameters I recommend would be the low bottle height or as, as low as possible with 20 cc flow rate or even lower, and then use the appropriate uh, vacuum. And you can see that these firmer rim or the cushions can generally be uh, easily be fed into that uh, FACO probe and then establish that communication uh, as, I, as I mentioned it, and then use whatever technique you want to, to remove the epinucleus. Uh, I prefer bimanual IA, but, but I do understand that coaxial works very well. You need to inject viscoelastic when you swap these bimanual, and bimanual instrumentation. And the key, the best part is that all this uh, femto procedure or inside out works for uh, any degree of nuclear density, except that if it is a black or brunison, you had it. But generally, they, they don't have that sort of thing. And this kind of grade three or, or maybe three plus uh, is easily amenable to these techniques, uh, shelling out and, and putting it uh, in the mouth of the FACO teeth. This is one more example of a, of a denser cataract. Use more energy, but less aspiration. You don't need to have a very high flow rate or vacuum. Instead, use a little more energy, protect the endothelium with uh, viscoelastic, OVD, dispersive viscoelastic, like visco, and then use your technique. Bowling technique uh, works quite well because it's already been uh, cushioned or uh, demarcated previously, but even if it is not, using more energy and debulking that nucleus is a good idea where you suspect the posture capsule defect or where you have a denser nucleus uh, in front of that capsule. And you can then take your time, uh, make it in a smaller fragment and, and, and really uh, present that to these denser plates to the FACO probe because it's already been done there very well. So, so denser nuclear cataract increases the rupture rate and I am no exception. I do rupture these with a very dense cataract, but these tricks do help me to reduce the, the PCR rate and then once again inject viscoelastic and remove the viscoelastic. But, but the last pearl, and I think this is the most important thing, preoperatively anticipate uh, the difficulty, counsel the patient, but patient will always be with you, but the, their children, their, their other relatives, when something doesn't go well, they, they appear on the scene postoperatively and make your life difficult. So counsel more than one time, patient and all the family members were likely to come uh, in post-operative time, and inform them about the multiple intervention in, in the event of rupture and various IOL fixation options. Typically they have a toric IOL or multifocal fan optics or something, and you may not be able to do that. So explain all the various options. But finally remember, Postipolar is not over until it's over. And this was a postipolar cataract, and, and we were relaxed. The assistants winded up the trolley, and this is what happened. Rapid increase in intraocular pressure because of the, because of the aggressive stromal hydration produced that. Luckily, uh, we were okay, and this is how it looked postoperatively. So, so the finally, uh, I think that these, these points are very important. Uh, it has helped me, and I'm sure it, it helps others. And uh, I really thank uh, uh, the Stalvers and uh, Dr. Titial, Dr. Maipal, and many others who have taught me how to manage post polar cataracts. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Abhay, for a wonderful presentation. As usual, uh, you have been a teacher 
to all the teachers and uh, we have learned so many things from you. Just uh, one uh, quick uh, comment. Uh, how would we appreciate uh, cases with uh, pre-existing posterior uh, capsular defect in these cases, I, clinical science way? I think, and what uh, uh, alternatives we have in, uh, during the surgery to avoid further you know, uh, difficulty in those cases? I think you, you have shown beautifully the value of intraoperative OCD, but most of us don't have it. And I, I recognize the contribution of late Dr. Daljit Singh, who first described this onion appearance and, and the and the dot sign. He couldn't describe it very well. We described it as the fish tail sign later on. So it was a very obvious thing. You will see that the typical appearance and the dots and the, and, and the moving vitreous. Uh, you, if you have a white cataract in front, B scan and UVM may tell you that. And once again, flex with the OCT uh, built in will give you a clue to the pre-existing defect on the flex machine. But, but Always be careful in an opaque cataract, a young person, and you suspect. So be prepared. Do not produce hydrodisection. I never do hydrodisection in a white cataract in a young person, for example. So things like that, that, that helps us very well. And in your, your technique of intraoperative OCT evaluation is fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abhay. Uh, now I invite my dear friend, uh, Dr. Aru who's a well-known uh, in this field and he's been uh, with us for a very, very long time, helping us in all instruction courses, not in India, across the world. And uh, he's been a pioneer uh, in, uh, in, in terms of uh, getting you know, Indians into our various forums. And he'll be talking to us today how to go in a compromised uh, Rexel situations which can be uh, in difficult cases or sometimes make it difficult also. And uh, how come out from these difficult situations? Dr. Arup, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Titiyal, for uh, having me here and for the kind words of introduction. Uh, current uh, techniques of uh, recommercification require a, an intact uh, capsular axis and capsular bag integrity. And most of the time, it happens uh, that way. However, uh, in about 0.75, 79 to 5.55% of the cases, literature showed that the rexis runs off to the periphery. And in one study from Moorfields, which was uh, published in the American Journal, this incidence was 1.5%, and the same study had a PCAD incidence of 1.65%. So the question arises, like when we are confronted with a rexis runner, how do we proceed? Do you continue with phaco emulsification or you convert to a safer non phaco technique? If we go ahead with phaco emulsification, do we modify our phaco techniques? Do we perform in intercapsular phaco or we emulsify the nucleus at a different plane? And finally, uh, what kind of intracular lens should be implanted when the rexis has run away to the periphery? So these are the points that I'm going to discuss with you in my presentation today. Uh, the timing of the tear is quite important. You know, it can, the rexus tear can happen in all these situations. And I have personally encountered a primary tear, particularly in intumescent and cataracts where rexus runs to the periphery. And uh, I have also encountered secondary tears, particularly when the rexus is small and uh, the cornea is not very healthy. There has been visibility issues where I have torn the rexus margin using my the, the chopper or my, maybe with the phaco. It is also important to be familiar with the risk factors and be prepared you know, in terms of uh, patient counseling as well as your, the OT, uh, uh, the vitrectomy unit, et cetera, et cetera, whatever is required to manage these uh, kind of cases. So I have had a lot of cases uh, of intumescent and cataracts over the years. And then, uh, this is a case which I thought I'd like to highlight. And most of my rexus tear has happened in uh, intumescent and cataracts. Here, of course, uh, the rexis could have been done differently, and my, my uh, focus is not on how we could have avoided this runoff. So here, it is tending to run to the periphery, emanating OVD in the peripheral aspect. The needle was not giving me much control, so I used the uterator forceps. I thought I had brought it back. Again, it had a tendency to go to the periphery. I used Helon 5, mind you, Helon 5, and it still runs to the periphery. So. I decided to continue with the phaco emulsification in this case. And my focus, as I said, is not going to be on Brexit, but on how to perform how phaco, how to manage the nucleus in this kind of situation. So I will be required, I will be asking for a, a, a 
larger capsule, anterior capsular opening, because if the opening is small and when there's a excess discontinuity, the intraocular manipulations, manipulations in the capsular bag may result in further uh, run of the rest rexis, uh, incomplete rexis to the periphery and you can get a run, wrap around tear. So I'll try to get a rexis about five to five, uh, capsular opening about five or 5.5 millimeters in size. It has to be done in uh, multiple stages and uh, whatever the redundant capsular flaps, they have to be trimmed because subsequently during phaco emulsification or during education aspiration, if we have dog earring of the capsular flaps, redundant capsular flaps, they'll tend to come into the aspiration port. Sometimes you're not knowing about it and then there could be disaster. So this is what I need to emphasize that have a decent opening of the anterior capsule. Some surgeons would, would like to give a relaxing cut in the opposite meridian. For example, here the rexis has run to the periphery. They would like to give a relaxing cut here. I am not a big, I'm not a very big fan of that strategy. So uh, I would start off with FECO at with a little high FECO power. I don't want any additional movement of the nucleus. So once I feel I'm deep enough into the substance of the nucleus, I'll start chopping it. While chopping it, make sure that the nucleus is elevated a little anteriorly. So during the lateral separation, there is no force that is transmitted to the capsular bed, to the area where the rexes are run to the periphery. And uh, vertical chopping is being performed using the Sinsky hook. You can use any hook, any, any chopper of your uh, choice. Make sure that during the lateral separation, you are not working in the area where the rexis has run to the periphery. So because the rexis has not been intact, the, the nucleus has a tendency to prolapse into the anterior chamber. So that tendency has to be kept in the mind. And you need to use copious amount of uh, a dispersive OVD, preferably viscose, to top up the anterior chamber to protect the corneal endothelium. Because many of these cases, are just, as I just mentioned, it is impossible to get a small chunks of nucleus into the anterior chamber. The nucleus rotation, again, has to be performed very, very gently. Uh, try, try to rotate the nucleus uh, in, such, in such a manner after filling up the bag with, capsule, with OVD so that there's not much of stress in the area where the rexis has gone to the periphery, and then continue with the phaco emulsification. You have to maintain the anterior chamber depth at all costs, because if there's a sudden shallowing of the anterior chamber, the rexis tear may become a rapid on tear. And then a small, a, a small or minor complication would become a very significant complication, which may even result in vitreous disturbance. So this particular discipline is very important. Use a dispersive OVD uh, to protect the corneal endothelium, to protect the area where the rexis may have run to the periphery. And once uh, the nucleus has been removed, so the question arises, uh, what kind of lens that you're going to use? So if you are using and planning for a single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens, I think one could still you know, keep it in the capsular bag because the unfolding happens very gently. But in this particular case, I am demonstrating the use of a three piece hydrophobic acrylic lens. Uh, so that is uh, that goes into about 2.8 or three millimeter incision. Make sure that the leading haptic just grazes on the anterior surface of the capsule. So of the anterior capsule. You may even uh, uh, deposit the, uh, the leading haptic on the, in the anterior chamber just in front of the iris. You are not sure if the pupil has come down that you are really anterior to the anterior capsule. The trailing haptic again, instead of being dialed in, is compressed and then just tucked under the iris. So you ensure that your the long the, the long axis of the lens, the haptics, you know, they are perpendicular to where the rexes are run to the periphery. And in certain situations where a toric aisle is planned, I mean, it, it can still be kept uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the capsular bag. And I have heard from colleagues that even if the rexis runoff happens in the axis of the toric lens alignment, you know, so that also has worked well in their hands. I have no personal experience. So this is the same patient followed up over a long period of time. And the patient has done extremely well. There has not been any aisle uh, displacement. Uh, I had also, also obtained, I forgot to mention in the previous slide, a button posted a button holding of the optic. And uh, this uh, may be a little controversial because uh, uh, if uh, capsular fibrosis happens, cap the bag undergoes contracture because of a single discontinuity in the rexis margin, there may be an asymmetric contracture and the, the, cap and the intraocular lens may be pushed, uh, may get decentered. But it has not happened over five or six cases over the last decade or so. The lens has stayed well centered the haptics in the sulcus and optic in the capsular band. So friends, uh, must remember that rexis is paramount for safe PECO. And further management options uh, in compromised rexis situations depends upon a lot of factors. For example, today, having been a PECO surgeon for almost 25 years now, more than that, now if I encountered a very hard cataract, a, a, a 
significant comorbidity in the in terms of shallow anterior chamber unhealthy cornea rexis has gone off to the periphery on the nasal side i would still not perhaps continue with phacomulsification i continue i will convert the case into a small incision catheter surgery situation for a younger surgeon who is not familiar with sics it doesn't really um, uh, he it's not really a shame to put a suture and refer the patient out to a, a to a more experienced surgeon because a patient is not going to thank you for your boldness when you have a complication when the visual outcome is suboptimal patient is going to thank you for good outcomes even if it doesn't matter whether it has been referred to another senior surgeon who has done a good job so it is it is a good idea to be familiar with manual small incision catheter surgery or you could even convert to an extra capsular catheter extraction phaco can still be performed uh, as i have just discussed if it is not an extremely hard cataract preferably to do it endocapsularly at times you can come up with iris plane the intracranial lens have to be chosen appropriately and i have already discussed about it so friends good phaco is still possible in rexis stair situation if you properly manage the intracranial environment and use a proper nucleus management strategy thank you very much for your kind attention julian video mode play hai yes uh, can we move ahead with the next speaker <laughs> Uh, Dr. Partha, I can see Dr. Partha Biswas has already logged in. Yes, uh, I'm here. Uh, Dr. Partha, yes, you've sir. come. Good, good. Right on time. Yes. So you must be too busy today, uh, but uh, I can understand uh, you have to have uh, your commitment also to be fulfilled in a various. Uh, and uh, other uh, instruction courses also thank you sir. and uh, we invite you to deliver your talk on phaco in a post refractive surgery cases yes sir dr patel yes sir one minute sir yes just one minute sir sure sure In the meantime, uh, just one question to uh, Dr. Arup. Are you there? Are you there? Dr. Abhay, you can answer. Okay, you are there. Okay, Partho, you you can start. Yes, sir. Yes. <coughs> so uh, the post-refractive uh, surgery phaco emulsification. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for giving me this topic for in your very important course. and i'll come directly to the challenges that we have in the post refractive eyes well the, it's a unique challenge to a cataract surgeon doesn't occur every day but when it occurs one has to be cognizant of the fact that this is a challenging situation it has to be dealt very very specifically patient is again let us remember used to spectacle independence has been off his spectacles or glasses and has enjoyed all this time these patients have very unrealistic expectations and there can be a low accuracy of the current uh, biometry formula and thereby a refractive surprise can occur the traditional uh, formula lose the accuracy in these patients and the refractive the post myopic refractive surgery patients end up with uh, the post operative hyperopia the surprise for these patients of uh, they are not able to deal with it and uh, it is becomes very difficult and it is a difficult situation if it becomes a post hyperopic patients the post hyperopic patients are also a difficult source so what are the sources of these errors it could be the keratometry and <clears throat> the corneal measurements are taken from a central 2 to 3 mm zone and which has been flattened by the refractive surgery and this assumption uh, of the sphero cylinder cornea leads to an overestimation by nearly 15 to 25% because also the relation of the anterior and the posterior cornea is altered and that assumption of the refractive index also becomes fallacious so the errors in the formula and the newer generations formula utilize the relationship between the k and the acd and that is the 
importance of the ELP. So in the myopic uh, character refractive surgery, these formula uh, predict fallaciously shallow ACD and leads to an anterior ELP and an underestimation of the IOL power causing these post-operative hyperopic surprises. So what are the formula that we use in these patients and uh, the historical method that is there? I'll just quickly go through these because we have more important aspects to deal in the later part. The uh, double K method and uh, the ACRS online formula. This is again very freely accessible in the website and the multiple formula that are available are used to calculate the IOL power and the average of all the formula is also displayed. Therefore, we have definite amount of improvement of the calculation for the IOLs. The tomography and helpful in analyzing the anterior as well as the posterior corneal curvature. The intraoperative FAK calculation, now I'd like to deal upon this, and uh, this is something that's very close to my heart. A very simple on-table retinoscopy after the extraction of the cataractus lens can be very, very accurate. And it can be a, a method whereby you can avoid uh, one of these refractive surprises. And I use it for all my patients, even after all the different uh, calculations and the formula that we have in place. So what we do is our best optometrist, he does an intraoperative effect cabinetry, uh, sorry, uh, a retinoscopy. And he tells us, yes, this is the range. And we try and keep it a, a little on the negative side. And God willing, we have not erred at all from this. So uh, the intraoperative, this is one part that uh, is uh, very important and we should adhere to this. The intraoperative FAK cabinetry is also can be used. Of course, limitations include the alteration of the intraocular pressure fixation. The ELP prediction is also not very accurate. And this is how uh, it is done. So this is the way we do it. And this patient is a FAKIC as of now, and we are doing the retinoscopy. And the role of post uh, preoperative counseling. This is very important. And the preoperative counseling also requires that you tell the patient that there be, may be a possibility of a lens exchange if something specifically goes wrong. And I make it a point to do this for every of these patients, God willing, not have had to explant lenses in such cases, but it must be told. The intraoperative challenges are important and uh, I'll take you through a few small short videos in which, uh, you know, the first uh, of these videos are important. Now, this is an RK patient where you can never, never predict a very, very good accuracy and especially uh, you have to be as accurate as possible and you have to tell the patient that there will be a cylinder power there. Now, these RK lines are very important. The side ports, you can always have it in between the RK marks, if you go beyond these RK marks, these RKs tend to open up during the course of the surgery and then you have a, another bigger problem where you have to suture it and then go in with a different place. If there are too many RK marks or, or what you could see that uh, I have made a scleral incision for the main port, then the scleral incision for the main port is a very important part again because you know that that part of the sclera absolutely holds that incision like a band. So we do not have to, uh, that possibility of the RK incisions giving way is not there. At times, even then an RK incision can give way partially, but it will never close in. So it's best that the main port incisions be placed in the scleral part. The rest of the things are quite simple. And once the nucleus, in these cases, it's usually a soft nucleus and once this is done then of course as i said that we need to do an intraoperative retinoscopy to get an accuracy as much as possible and avoid a surprise so this is a, a place in which we had an opening up of the rk incision and uh, so this has to be sutured and then you have to find another place and then go in once again now this is a mystery case that uh, i if i have time then i will say maybe we can go over it fast a little bit uh it's a 43 or maybe we can skip this mystery case and uh, can go on to 
the post lasic uh, phaco emulsification the flap and hinge position has to be determined before the planning the corneal incision because in these cases uh, if one rubs on the cornea much too much then what we can have is even a displacement of these flaps because the flap let us remember of these post lasic patients are adherent only maximally to the sides and they can lift up and if uh, too much of brushing has been done it can actually give way at times so now the post operative refraction uh, is important and uh, now the post icl phaco emulsification in a post uh, icl phaco emulsification this icl is a very thin structure and you do not need to do any amount of calculation of your actual biometry because it is so thin that these will not give rise to surprise the only key is explantation of uh, uh, these lenses and i'll quickly show maybe in 2 minutes that uh, this is a video which of a uh, patient that had undergone phaco that had undergone an icl surgery and went into difficulties so what happened is this patient uh, after the icl got back extremely good vision but developed a retina detachment nearly 6 months later and with this retina detachment then uh, after 3 months of the settling the retina by a vr surgeon this patient developed a total cataract so what would have happened most likely there would have been a lens touch and this uh, white cataract is what uh, was there so we needed to take out this intraocular the icl first and then go on to the removal now the icl removal was not so difficult not very traumatic at all and we could remove the icl nicely so hand over hand and the icl came off so once the icl comes off i thought my job was nearly done or 90% done done but i was in for trouble so we stained the capsule and then we went on to the capsular excess now watch what is going to happen you could see that uh, there was synechia there uh, in the initial part which i had to separate now while i was doing this capsular excess now we had a capsular excess run out not in one place but in two places so with this capsular excess run out so where are we so we are in a place where the capsular excess has run out and we have a very unstable bag because remembering the fact that there is also a posterior capsular dehiscence at some place where the which uh, we are surgeon would have touched the posterior capsule and this is what we see that there is a dehiscence but god willing this dehiscence was totally fibrosed so once it was fibrosed so it was a saving grace and i knew that uh, this fibrosis would be helpful so we had uh, the single piece and the multi piece all in place but i placed in the multi piece lens i knew it would go to the sulcus uh, the pupil was also coming down so in the sulcus it rested now what to do with this thick fibrous plaque so the plaque was there so what we did is with the mvr we went in we we uh, made a vitrector and then came in with a vitrector to do an opening so it was not a very large opening it just about a about a 2 mm opening and that was done thank you very much for your kind attention sir thank you partha uh, wonderfully have uh, presented the entire gamut of scenarios which can happen in a post refractive surgery patients well covered i think we are just on time and uh, before uh, uh, we discuss something i would like to thank all my you know instructors who have done uh, wonderful uh, work for this particular ic and they've been a part of uh, this ic for uh, so many years and people have uh, gained uh, so much uh, knowledge and surgical tips thank you all of you for joining us today and uh, wish you all the best keep uh, safe and uh, keep everybody safe thank, thank you, you very much sir thank, thank you, you so much thank you Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. we have finished in time sir thank you very much so <laughs> time keeper ah <huh>? good <laughs> sir aap hi ne to time laga diya mere pe to kya kare time pe kadam karo time pe kadam karo sir lekin ye cheez bada seekh hai hamare liye we have actually started on time and all the sessions yeah. what billing yeah. are running on time sir yeah this time is so wonderfully connected the only only problem was when you gave the session to was <laughs> because there were all ladies there rare right rare right disease we had to wait for 15 minutes for the covid session yesterday national symposium <laughs>
<laughs> but the lady here is keeping the time very well for us. So thank you. Yes. Shop Lila, yes. great work. The AB team is doing a great job, sir. Yes, thank absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, so, uh, thank you all. Thank you all. One minute, uh, sir. We just have one minute and one question that we can solve in that one minute. By Dr. Bang, uh, do, do you do a PIP? That is what the question that he had asked for. So yes. in a one minute, uh, can we just answer this question? PIP is picture in picture. I don't know what are you. What is the question? So uh, okay. I have just uh, written it in the chat box. What? PBI. The question is written as PBI. Do you do PBI? Correct. Peripheral button eye detection. <laughs> I, I don't know the, <laughs> what the question. What it meant. I also couldn't figure it out. Even I couldn't figure it out. Nevertheless, thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your expertise and your experience with all of us. Thank you so much for ending it on.